Now we are discussing repair techniques in antiquity and in historical times, meaning 16th to the 18th, 19th century. Now I have here in my hand an extremely interesting bronze. Ulrike, who is here now, uh, is going to explain you what is shown. But what is remarkable about this bronze, it's beautifully done in details and obviously was broken in antiquity and they repaired it with a, in German, called Überfangustechnik. Also it's a sort of overlay casting. Um, so you had the arm, this arm broke off, and one foot broke off, and they cast on top of it in a much more primitive style, because the bronze itself is absolutely top Roman, uh, classical Roman, uh, style with all the details, a beautiful body, and then you have this incredibly clumsy uh, arm with a very primitive eagle in a very local style. So we could even talk of a repair in the Roman periphery or booty, which was taken in war, we don't know, and then repaired locally, uh, because the bronze itself is of the highest quality. Maybe you want to add something, you will see on the detailed photographs what we mean, uh, I can't show yes. it to you here on the camera, <laughs> but this part here and here has been repaired already in the second century, most probably AD. Mm -hmm. So I would I would like to say something about the object itself. So it's showing um, the god Jupiter, and yeah, it's in a type which goes probably back to the Hellenistic period already. But as you probably know, is that uh, the the Romans they copied a lot. Um, and yeah, they took the, the Greek types to redo things or to redo statues. And um, we were discussing about this bronze uh, a lot because if you have a close look at the face, um, you get the idea that there are some pottery features visible. Um, and it's very difficult to tell actually because, I mean, the bearded man, it's also the, it's the Jupiter iconography. But if you really have a close look, it's, it's, the eyes are a little bit, it's, it's not idealized, I would say, it's, but... No, and he has a, he has a nose, which is remarkable, slightly yes. bent. So, yeah, it's, it's like, yeah, it's like individual, so the nose, it's, it's difficult, it's really difficult to tell. Well, because I had an idea and you uh, t took it Yeah, up. I mean, it's easy to, it's easy to start, it's easy where we can... It's an Antonine. Uh, emperor, uh, if it is, it must be in the at least in the second century. Yeah. So that, that's where you can start yeah. because it's a bearded man. Well, it reminded me of the Sesterzi of uh, Elius Caesar, uh, the co-regent of Marcus Aurelius. He's mostly forgotten, so he didn't do many remarkable things. But it's Elius Caesar mm -hmm. who has this uh, slightly puffy face with beard, and he's you know we have a lot of coins of this emperor. Um, but uh, it's not Marcus Aurelius and it's neither Lucius Verus nor is it really mm. Commodus. But it is someone with portrait feature on a Jupiter bronze. I don't think a private would address himself as Jupiter, so it's imperial. And this may again explain why they took the great care to yeah, that's, repair it that's what locally really... with a very local technique. We might be here. Uh, it might come from a small uh, shrine in honor of the imperial family, having been damaged and then carefully locally repaired later on. This is, of course, pure hypothesis, but most interesting. Would, yeah, would I, I, I yeah, but I, I, what I really, what you really recognize is that the portrait is re very detailed compared to the rest of the body. I mean, it's a beautiful body, of course, but you really see kind of contrast. Yes. So, and that also speaks for, for pottery, for that, that this is really a portrait. But it's miniature portraiture, which is yes, remarkable because it's extremely rare. Yes, but the longer you, you look, the, the more detailed yes. it is. I mean, every single lock is, is carefully done. Yeah, and I, think I, I, I come from a numismatist family, so I reacted immediately when I saw that. Uh, the previous owner was not even aware that there was an imperial portrait hiding behind, nor the dealer beforehand. Um, and that's how I immediately seized the piece and saw that this is an imperial portrait. We can't be for sure because it's tiny and you see it on the enlarged photographs. Yeah. Now, the other examples we have here are historical repairs. Now, I like to wear several noses, as you can see. Do you want the nose? 
So mm -hmm. we have here marble noses um, and a lead half face. So this is the type of repairs they used in historical times. And very often these are the only reminiscent pieces giving an idea of provenance because when we talk of provenance you either have applied paperwork um, which gets lost and which is now needed in the last 30 years people are becoming really aware of it but much more revealing are the intrinsic remains of old histories now lost because nobody cared about the history a hundred years ago or 50 years ago and these are noses I took off from sculptures where they were very disturbing and they're fun objects now and here in front um, of you is a very fine bust, half-size bust of Euripides, the tragedy writer. It's a Roman work after a famous uh, Greek original and it's very charming and you see here beautifully done in marble like those noses but this is much better quality here. The missing bits were carved off, uh, the, the break was carved off and then they applied and glued a marble nose to this part and the same applies for this lower part of the bust which is very well done. They even copied the... Yes, they took the same the marble, they, they, they really tried yeah. to, to take the marble, no. they tried at least, so it's probably an Italian it's restoration. Similar. Yeah, And they followed the break, meaning they didn't just flatten it or saw it off, no, they followed the ancient break, of course smoothening the surface at the inside and then attaching all this bit um, to reconstruct this bust and this is a typical, in my eyes, a typical repair of the 18th century, late 18th century. We know of Cavaceppi who was a famous sculptor who had a workshop with up to 30-40 people working for him for all the uh, nobility buying ancient marbles in Rome. You know, this was a big, big, big business in the late 18th century with agents. Every king and prince in Europe would send his agents uh, to buy them in Italy and have them made up by Cavaceppi or other ateliers, workshops and very often we don't know the history anymore but we still have the traces of the repairs. So for me this is a much more secure provenance than any written document. Um, uh, this is so important and we have this technique which funnily enough you have the same having been all supplied in antiquity. In antiquity they knew how to attach marble to marble and this wonderful uh, relief portrait of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius which was applied to a relief and you see here they did a technique which you see in architecture and in architecture archaeologists use the Greek term anaturosis uh, where you smoothen the joining at outer part and the inner part is hacked but very finely hacked so when you put fine mortar in it it's actually adhesive and sticks together with the background as glue and to secure it even more they drilled a hole here properly for a clamp. This is a technique which is really known in architecture. Yeah that's but very unusual. It's very it's unusual and scope. connected with this. I believe we have here actually something very rare. It's probably from an imperial monument uh, an architectural frieze where you have the emperor, it could be a small triumphal arch, uh, reliefs on a big monument, we will unfortunately never know. Interesting also the mound, which is a mound possibly beautifully done. They even took care to put lizard skin to cover the, the screw. Um, it's a, for me, typical 1930s mound. But again, if the mound is gone, we have very little about the collecting history of this piece remaining. So these hints of repairs in antiquity and now